Session two, finding our purpose in relationships. Today we have Deepa Chandrasekhar, the quintessential Proverbs 31 woman, who straddles the business world with ease and brings the best of practices from the corporate world into the world around her. She's a corporate leader with about 17 years experience who has worked across multinational organizations. Her passion is people and her calling is taking the Jesus model of leadership to the marketplace. Deepa works with various NGOs across the country, especially in the areas of child trafficking and child empowerment. Her desire is to help these organizations by supporting them in the areas of strategy and leadership coaching and to help them maximize their impact. Deepa and her husband, Sridhar, live in Bangalore. I warmly welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, Tina. Um, thank you for having me here, APC Church. And uh, so amazing to see uh, faces whom, which I've not seen for more than 20 years, uh, and some more than that. Uh, you know, God has brought us here and has given me the opportunity to meet them, and some very familiar faces that I get to meet often as well. Uh, and uh, new faces too, uh, and I hope to get to know you. But thank you for having me here. Um, I especially want to thank Mohan. I know he's not here, but uh, he's someone who's really invested in me and helped me find a, uh, and live out my life purpose. So uh, thank you, thanks to him for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, and Viveka, I don't know where you are. You must be busy somewhere, but yeah. Thank you for uh, you know, all the coordination and just making it so simple and easy. Uh, God bless you. I want to apologize, firstly, for not having a PPT. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, for those of you who uh, you know, are Corner House fans, uh, not another death by PPT here. So <laughs> apologies for that. Um, uh, I know um, Tina mentioned this, but it's been on my heart since yesterday as well. And I want to share it with you this morning that none of you are here by accident. Um, you know, I feel led to say that, that you're not here, uh, you know, if you're regretting coming here on a Saturday and, uh, you know, not having that time off, I want to tell you, you're not here by accident. Um, God is here to share something with you this morning uh, through the day. Um, you know, all of us have big life questions that we want answered. And I hope that uh, through uh, a lot of it, I'm sure, through Rajiv's session has, has uh, sort of spoken to me personally. And I'm sure through the day as well, uh, God will connect with you in your own individual point of need. Um, yeah, so we'll have time for some Q&A as well, possibly later on. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts here present be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and redeemer. Amen. Um, you know, I mentioned a lot of us have questions um, and, you know, most of the Christian professional sort of programs that I go to, there are some standard questions that are asked. Uh, one is, you know, um, how do I balance this competitive corporate world with, you know, my faith? It seems almost contradictory, you know, so that's one big question you tend to hear. Another is life work-life balance, you know, how do I balance uh, my work and how do I balance life and everything else I do, how do I balance the two? The other is around time management, how do I do all that, what, all what God has called me to do, right? How do I balance my time? Um, you know, I want to sh share uh, a little bit of about, you know, how these questions have been answered in my life. One is, you know, on the whole uh, corporate life, balancing, um, you know, the, the culture of the corporate world, the competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis what God has called us to be. Um, I want to tell you how my life started and uh, in, in terms of the corporate world. Like Rajiv's son, my 
I did exactly the opposite of what my parents wanted me to do. My parents were teachers and then got into full-time ministry, and they thought that was the way, right? You know, you need to be a teacher. And uh, so I did my graduation, and they wanted me to do my master's and then MPhil, and my dad had it all planned out. I went and did my uh, CAT, and Aji and me ended up being batchmates in MBA. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I remember the day I got my admission letter, and... Uh, I told my dad, he said, I don't have money for this, this sort of fees. Uh, you're supposed to study in WCC where the fees is much lower. Susan will know that. We were in the same college together. Um, but I said, no, this, I think this is what I want to do. This is what I feel is something that's important to me. I didn't know the words life, purpose, and calling, and all of that then. Um, so my father said, let's pray. I don't have the money. <laughs> you know, easy way out as a parent. Uh, so we prayed. The, the ad advance fee that needed to be given was 10,000 rupees. And my father was a missionary then. 10,000 back then was a lot of money. So he said, let's pray. And he knew this is not going to happen. I'll get her in, in back into WCC to do her master's. Um, we prayed. And our home was a small home in Chennai. That was The door was right on the road. And... Um, we opened our eyes and we could see this bike go past three or four times. Yeah, and um, he then, that man then came and knocked the door and said, can you give me a glass of water? We got him in. He was familiar because we knew he lived in that neighborhood. We've seen him before. Uh, so he came in, he had a glass of water, and then uh, he spoke about very random things, and we were wondering, what, what does he want? Why is he here? And then he gave us this envelope. Uh, he said, I'm on the way to the bank. But every time I, I passed your house, I felt like I needed to come in. So I went back and forth three, four times because I needed to put this in the bank. But anyway, it's, it's for you. And he gave us that money, and it was 10,000 rupees, exactly what I needed to pay the fees. Um, you know, so I felt the hand of God taking me. My dad didn't have an excuse after that. He had to use the money for that. And, and uh, you know, the rest uh, have unfolded by itself. Um, so yeah, so I started my desire to be in the corporate world then. I didn't have any exposure. The exposure I had was, you know, going on Bible camps, uh, going for uh, Sunday school, choir. You know, I had all the exposure there, but nothing in the corporate world except my brother uh, who lived in a different city. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and the reason I wanted to do it was I didn't want my parents to ever be in a financial difficulty. That was my driving purpose, you know, no, nothing else bigger. I said, I, I, I see how people in ministry struggle, so I want to earn really well and support ministries. Um, so I started working, and, and that competitive spirit was in me, you know, like I really wanted to excel. And in that process, uh, in the first few years, I'd, uh, I would burn bridges, I would, um, you know, be as competitive as I needed to be to get ahead. Um, and then, I, but I felt I was doing the right thing because I, I wanted to support my parents, I wanted to support their ministry and many others as well. Um, Somewhere down the line, and, uh, you know, I love what Rajiv said, you know, that as God reveals, gently reveals his purpose, I also want to encourage many of you who may be in the initial days of your career, uh, you know, that um, sometimes it doesn't come to you on day one, you know. God gradually, gently nudges you in the right direction. And uh, as I went through the initial years, I felt God uh, telling me very clearly, you know, that it's great what you're doing. Uh, for, for your family and your parents and making sure that they lack nothing. But also, you know, I have a purpose for you. And how I learned that, you know, it's a very simple story from the Bible of David and Goliath. Um, you know, I would always wonder growing up, why didn't God kill Goliath himself? You know, he could have done it with far more style and eloquence. Uh, with um, with a lightning flash or anything, you know, something exciting like that. Why David there to kill Goliath? Because one is the larger purpose of, you know, the God of Israel, the battle is the Lord's and all of that. The mission to, uh, you know, to show the world that the God of Israel is real. But it was also for David's personal edification, you know, to know that he, God has a purpose in his life for him in that moment. You know, and I realized that, yes, while there is a larger 
thing that I need to do and serve others. I think God is also calling me personally to something. So it was through that journey that I realized that my calling is people in the corporate world, uh, you know, um, that I am called to be in the secular world, to be with, the, I spent my entire, um, you know, education, life of education only with Christians all around me. I don't think I had a single non-Christian friend all, all my growing up life. But I think uh, I was very clear that God has called me to be in the secular world, uh, you know, to be with people who might never have the opportunity to come into a church who might never read a Bible, who might dislike Christians, who have very strong opinions on conversion and everything else. God has called me to be there, uh, to be a role model, to be a beacon of light, to be a, a support system there. You know, so the learning for me was that, you know, there's a larger purpose, uh, an organizational purpose or, or a larger purpose that God might have called us to, but there's also a personal journey that he takes us to reach that path. Uh, we don't have to stress and worry, you know, oh God, what is my purpose now? I was counseling this girl who was um, doing her MBA in Christ, and she, I think now is the time they have to choose their electives between uh, finance and uh, marketing. So she was um, caught between marketing and HR. Like She's like, Akka, what do I do? I don't know if I should do marketing or I should do... And the amount of stress and anxiety surrounding my dis her decision was really sad to see. So I sat her down and calmed her down. I said, both are amazing choices. Don't stress. Whatever you take, you know, God will chart out the path for you. And sometimes we struggle and worry about these things. But I want to tell you from my life journey that, you know, God just directs and leads you through that. So like I was saying, my calling is in the corporate world, to be there uh, and to, to be with people who might never have a chance to uh, come to a church and sit through programs like this. Um, but as much as I love the corporate world, I think a couple of things, few things that I want to share with you today, you know, as contrasts uh, of what we see in the corporate world versus what God calls us to. Um, the thing about purpose is, right, and um, Rajiv, I'm going to draw a lot from what you said. I hope you don't mind. Uh, this whole dog thing really stuck with me. Um, you know, there is a purpose of what we do in terms of the example of the whole dog farm. But if it is not impacting people, right, we need to re go back to the drawing board. God's purpose always impacts people. Um, you know, and I think that's like the litmus test of what God has called us to do. You know, if you're writing songs, is it impacting people? If you're a photographer, are you able through that, like my husband's a wild, passionate wildlife photographer, through that raise funds for the various NGOs that we work with? What, are, what has God called you to do and how is it impacting people? I think that's like the litmus test. Um, of God's heart is always about people. It's always about relationships. It's always about connecting uh, with, with those around us. And I want to draw three contrasts, uh, you know, in terms of relationships and how we relate to people, what we see in the corporate world and what God has called us to. Um, and, and the Bible is very, very clear in terms of, you know, the fact that we, in John 15, 18, uh, he says, right, that you are not of the world. You may be there. So in this whole question of balancing the competitive spirit with our faith, honestly, there's just no balance. You always lean on the side of your faith. When we're called to be out of the world. We're not of the world. We're called to be there, but be examples. And then, of course, Romans 12, 2, that says, do not conform to the world, right? Um, so we are called to be there wherever you are placed, but we need to be different. We need to stand out. We need to stand for the principles um, of, of our faith. So the first contrast I'd like to draw is um, what, the, what the corporate or, or the secular world calls compartmentalization, right? Um, so we move from compartmentalization to the contrast that God calls us to connectedness. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through that. Um, 
this whole thing of work and life balance, keep your work separate, keep your life separate, uh, keep your secular separate, keep your sacred separate is not biblical. Yeah, um, I remember in the early days of my career, I was a little bit of an emotional person. So my boss called me into his room one day and said, Deepa, you can't get so emotional. And I had a bit of a sharp tongue, so I said, but you said just yesterday in the town hall that we're supposed to bring our whole selves to work, right? You want us to be passionate about work, so I'm passionate about it. I'm not okay with what has happened, right? So we're asked to keep, a, we have to compartmentalize our emotions, compartmentalize your personal life, don't bring it into work, yeah? Um, and that's Greek thinking, the sacred and the secular, separation of the two. Um, you know, keep your personal beliefs outside when you enter the workplace. Um, but the Hebrew thinking is that God is always with us. You know, wherever you go, whatever you do, God is with us. And that's why we have Emmanuel, that God is with us. Now, where does that thinking come from? Any ideas? How did the Hebrew thinking arrive at that, that God is always with us? Yeah? In the Old Testament, the pillar of fire by um, night and the pillar of cloud by day, right? Um, I know, Sumati, we've talked about this before, but um, you know that the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day was always with them through the... Imagine that, you know, just pause for a minute and imagine that. 40 years, you're walking through the desert. Um, and you have this pillar around you all the time. 40 years is a long time, right? You, you do a lot of things during that time. People are born, people die, um, marriages, uh, births. Um, what other big events can there be? Um, anything. And also in the small things, yeah? Uh, daily as you're cooking, as you're cleaning, as you're, uh, you know, helping your children, as you're in the restroom, as you're... Uh, chatting with your friends, no matter what, the pillar is always there. They, there couldn't be a moment in those 40 years that they, they felt, I'm alone. God is not there with me through this time. Yeah, so this thinking of God is always with me wherever I am. Vis-a-vis -vis the, the worldly view of compartmentalization. Keep it separate. Keep your life separate. Keep your personal life separate. Keep your secular and your sacred. The pillar was always there. Yeah, um, Compartmentalization is what the corporate world teaches us. Uh, and it's so deeply rooted in our thinking. But Jesus role modeled something completely different. When he was discipling his, uh, his 12, he did life with them. Yeah, he did life with them. He ate with them. He walked with them. Uh, he had his good moments with them. Um, he had his difficult times with them. With them, he wept, he cried, he grieved, he got angry, all with them. You know, life was done with people around him. Um, he got betrayed in front of them, he got beaten in front of them. He didn't portray, he didn't say every Saturday evening we'll meet five to six and we'll do uh, Bible study together and the rest of the time you're on your own. No, Jesus did life with each one of those people that he discipled. Um, yeah, and he invested in them. The reason I'm talking about compartmentalization is because it's something I struggled with personally, you know. Uh, so after that incident with my boss, I thought, okay, now I have to be all this amazing professional, uh, you know, who, who's completely detached from people, only focused on work, uh, you know, and that's how I kind of built my image, um, you know. And, but God dealt with me in this area that unless you are vulnerable with people around you, unless you open up to people around you, you're never going to build that relationship with them. Um, you know, so I started doing that. And I want to share, you know, that sometimes, and it was hard learning for me as well, that I would go back to all these people I work with, to the, to the ministry that my dad was part of, and I would share all these things that I would learn in the corporate world. But I think God dealt with me to say there's so much that you can take from the Christian world back to your work. Do you do that? Yeah, you're always bringing things from there to this side. Are you able to take what you learn here in the church with courage and implement it there? Um, so I started thinking, like, what is it we do so naturally here, like visiting the sick, 
right? So I started doing that. Every time someone in my uh, team would be sick, I would try to visit them. Of course, the sick leave came down drastically in my team because he knew <laughs> the boss is going to come home. <laughs> yeah, so all this that was uh, unexpected perk of it. <laughs> but the thing is, I started visiting. Uh, you know, every time someone, not, not of course for cold and things like that, but genuinely unwell. My mother is unwell. She's in the hospital. I would say, tell a few others in my team, come, let's go. Let's visit. And it was unheard of. It was like, why are you doing, you're intruding in their personal life. They may not like it. I'm like, let's just go. We'll just buy some fruits, whatever it is. Let's just go sit. Um, you know, so many relationships have been built through small acts like that. Uh, recently, um, you know, one of, uh, uh, one of the members in my team uh, message texted me saying my husband has had a brain stroke. Um, and she just moved from uh, Gurgaon to um, Bangalore. And um, it was about nine in the night. And uh, I said, I, I can't just sit around. It, by the time I decided it was about 11 in the night and I went to the hospital and I, I realized she was just all alone sitting outside the ICU. Yeah, and it was such a moment of fellowship. She's not a believer. I didn't, of course, say anything about Christ or anything. But just sitting with her outside that ICU room, uh, you know, and uh, I carried some snacks with me. And, um, you know, just we just sat there and chatted. And she was telling me, I, I've known her for, for a year and a half now. But in that two hours, I think the relationship we were able to build was exponentially more than all that we did together over the last one and a half years. Um, you know, she told me how hard it is to move cities, how hard it is not to have family around. Uh, you know, I, she said I was considering going back to Gurgaon, but you know, just knowing that people like you are here is helpful. What are we taking from the church back to our corporate world, right? Uh, you know, how are we using what we learn here, there? Um, another example of, you know, not compartmentalizing and how it helps. Um, I struggled with anxiety for a few years, so I recognized it in other people, and, and it gives me a lot of empathy to see, to see people, um, you know, going through that. So there was, in a few years back, there was someone in my team struggling with this, but I don't think she had the courage to say, tell anyone at work, because she thought it would impact her career, her, her growth. So I sat down and told her my story. So I said, hey, you know what? Uh, um, over a coffee, that you know, this is what I struggled with for many years. Uh, she didn't say anything then. I'm not claiming any victory, but a week later, she came and said, you know what? I want to share something with you. And we walked that journey with her, you know, over the next one year. Uh, she got off her meds uh, and she came out of it. And um, we never, she never came to Christ, but uh, she was someone who started getting deeply involved in, in a lot of the other social stuff that I do. She started getting involved and she said, what is tithing? Why do you tithe? In one of the conversations I talked about, she said, why do you support so many NGOs? How do you do it? So I talked about the concept of tithe. She said, that's very interesting. I want to do it. You know, vulnerability and being able to share, um, you know, and breaking these barriers of work and life have really, really helped me be, uh, build relationships. Um, I want to tell you, people everywhere are hurting. You know, people everywhere are the same, whether it's here in this room, whether it's out in some, um, in, in your homes or in, in the corporate world, people are the same. We create these barriers and these compartments and create these distinctions, but people are the same everywhere, you know. Um, God is calling us today to move away from compartmentalization to connectedness. Um, you know, going deeper in our interactions um, going, being more vulnerable, being more real about who we are, um, especially, especially in the corporate world, you know, which is so cutthroat, which is so competitive, which is so, people are waiting to use your weaknesses against you, uh, you know? How are you and I different in that place? Um, you know, how do we take our whole selves to work, to quote my boss, and, uh, you know, with kindness, with love and all the good stuff that we learn at church, you know, not leaving it here. If you've learned about purpose today, can you get a little group together on Monday and, hey, you know, this is what I learned, this is what I shared, this is what I want to share with you. Uh, you know, taking all the good things we learn 
and uh, in 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 the christian world in the church to our relationships and making it deeper in the corporate world so compartmentalization to connectedness the second thing the second contrast i want to draw is individualism yeah individualism to impact so compartmentalization to connectedness individual individualization to impact um so you all know right i mean uh, that this year the I, uh, it sort of sector went through a bit of a i don't know what's the right word tough phase, tough phase. thank you for that very diplomatic sentence because it's recorded um, went through a tough phase and you know a lot of organizations including the one i work with made some very very difficult decisions while a lot of it was externally published uh, some of it were internal including hey you know some of us some some parts of the organization won't get growth as fast as you expected, things like that. Um, and then we had a town hall after that. So someone, um, you know, in my slightly extended team, raised this very vocally, very aggressively, saying that, you know, um, how does it matter if you're making tough decisions? You know, in quotes, tough decisions. You know, I have worked hard the last one year. I need to get promoted. How does it matter to me? I mean, you are making the tough decision. It's happening to someone else. Someone else is getting impacted. I need my growth, my promotion. I have worked hard. Uh, you know, the focus on I, me, myself, my growth, my, my sort of success is just so strongly ingrained. Uh, you know, I need to be rewarded no matter what. It doesn't matter what is happening to the others, what sort of impact anyone else is going through. And, and we have built that culture, right, in the corporate world. Um, so this focus on myself, um, irrespective of what is happening to the larger community, you know, but I want to, of course, I raised it vocally. I was shot down saying that's, that's the kind of attitude we want to, you know, inculcate, you know, that performance drive. So um, I, the realization of interconnectedness. You know, that we can't, we are not, we are not here, none of us are here by ourselves. You know, the amount of input, I'm sure if each of you could stand up and give testimony of the amount of people that have impacted your lives positively, that have helped you possibly get your job, who have connected you to opportunities, who've invested time coaching you, um, you know, who've trained, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on, you know. None of us are here by ourselves, um, you know. This inter realization of interconnectedness. To be is to interbe. I'll repeat that. To be is to interbe. Um, I'm going to ask you to stretch your imagination a little with me this morning. Uh, and we're going to look at the story of Luke 18, 35 to 19, 6. Okay, so this is a very, very famous story. Uh, the story of Zacchaeus and... Um, Bartimius, right? The blind man. Um, so we read these two stories in isolation. Whenever we read, we read Zacchaeus, we read Bartimius separately, we read Zacchaeus separately. But actually, it's it's one connected story divided by a chapter. Um, you know, so both are from the same city, Jericho. Um, you know, both have lived there. Um, um, Bartimius was a local man, um, and I'd like to believe he was extremely vocal, loud and vocal. So I think a lot of, and I don't, it's not, that's not my imagination. I get it from the Bible because they shushed him and then he screamed again and all of that. So he's, he's a man with some personality and loud, and I'm sure a lot, everyone knew him there. Yeah, so um, he got healed and he followed Jesus. Um, you know, and this attracted crowds because he was well known. He was sitting at, at the gates of the city of Jericho and um, sc possibly screaming his lungs out for, for money. And Jesus heals him and then he follows and a ho whole lot of crowds sort of get attracted to this and follow. Um, you know, but then we jump into the Zacchaeus story. But Zacchaeus would have been attracted to Jesus because of what happened to, Barth to to the blind man, right? Like, because of that crowds, because of that news of that healing, the news would have spread so fast, you know, that someone is, this guy who was sitting by the gates for so many years has been healed. 
And then, of course, the famous Zacchaeus story and come down and all of that. Zacchaeus' story is so deeply interlinked, right, to Bartholomew's. So I want to read this quote uh, that Martin Luther King put so well. He says this, it really boils down to this, that all of life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. We are all made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Yeah, I mean, the beautiful verse that Rajiv quoted about, you know, David being, um, you know, for his generation, right? We are not called to be impactful in isolation. You know, our career is not for ourselves. Um, you know, we are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Um, following Jesus is one of the most important decisions all of us make, and we make that individually, right, for ourselves. I can't go on the strength of my parents' faith. None of us can go on each other's faith. It's the most individual act of faith, but that act always has communal repercussions, right? If what your life purpose is, is not impacting people, that's the litmus test, yeah? What has God called you that it has to impact someone else positively? I want to substantiate what I'm saying. Um, so I, I was reading this book called The Genius of Jesus. If you ever get a chance, please do. Uh, it's available on Kindle, The Genius of Jesus by Irwin Raphael McManus. Yeah? Beautiful book about, so Jesus is 100% man, 100% God. So the 100% man bit he elaborates on, because you always focus on the God bit, right? Like God is miraculous, he, all of that. But the 100% man, how Jesus lived as a man and lived out his purpose as a man is what this book talks about. Um, and I'm going to read a small excerpt from it so you can listen, uh, listen to me. I'll go slow. Academics have a term for how a culture is transformed through belief in Jesus Christ. Okay, they have a term for that. And that term is called redemption and lift. So it's a term that says that belief in Jesus Christ impacts cultures. Yeah, and that term is called redemption and lift. So in his book titled Under Development is a State of Mind, economist Lawrence E. Harrison observed how the Christian mindset had a measurable effect on the economic development and prosperity of societies. His analysis focused not on the ceiling of wealth, but the living conditions and well-being of the common citizen. So he does this study, this uh, economist Lawrence E. Harrison, and observes that the Christian mindset, okay, has a measurable effect on economic development, prosperity of societies, etc. So he's not focusing on the, uh, the per capita income, but he's saying overall living conditions and well-being of the common citizen. So he goes on to say certain mindsets and certain belief systems create the internal psychological mechanisms needed to rise above poverty when the opportunity is given. So there's a certain belief system that allows people and us to rise above poverty. The valuing of education, the treatment of women, the emergence of an entrepreneurial mindset following your purpose, personal responsibility for choices. These are characteristics that actually lift people out of poverty and that is elevated in a Christian society. Yeah, Even, and I don't subscribe to this view, this is the author's view, even if Jesus is only an idea, yeah, that idea changes the way humans approach life. Jesus is, even if Jesus is just an idea, you know, belief in him, changes the way we look at life because the focus on ourselves completely stops. You know, the focus is always on those around us. It's always on the people around us. Um, you know, and I love this because you can see the examples over and over and over again. CMC, we talked about it. I mean, look at the number of colleges, schools that most of us have benefited from, hospitals that um, many of us would have been born in, um, you know, organizations, uh, I, I know Angelin is here, where are you? Yeah, 
Uh, Angelin's sister, Catherine, uh, runs an organization called Freedom Firm that rescues girls between the age of four to 12 from sex trafficking. You know that? Four-year-old girls. Uh, we've heard of World Vision. Vision Rescue is another organization I work with. You know, the Christian mindset of saying, Lord, the purpose that you've given me is not just about me. It's not my individual success, my individual purpose. It's about impacting society and changing cultures, yeah? Um, God has not called us for our, just for our own personal success and glory and all of that. Uh, he's called us to make an impact. We are called for so much, so much more. Um, individualization to impact. So the sec first one was compartmentalization to connectedness. The second is individualization to impact. And the third one is um, spectatorship to involvement. Yeah? Um, spectatorship to involvement. You know, um, there's so many phrases nowadays that I, I never heard growing up. Uh, one of them is me time. <laughs> Never had any sort of me time growing up. Uh, you know, dare I even ask for it. I would have got quite, quite a thrashing. Um, you know, uh, personal space was not, I didn't have my own bedroom for God knows how long. Yeah, I never felt the need for it as well. Personal space. Uh, another one is, uh, you know, comfort zone. You know, oh, this is my comfort zone. You know, and we draw these lovely circles, you know, concentric circles. This is my comfort zone. And then I'll take the next step into my et cetera, et cetera, right? We've created all these things to keep ourselves comfortable. You know, to make sure we are fine. You know, there's nothing that comes untoward happens to us. Life is easy for us. You know, um, we've created these sort of auras around us that, you know, it's important to have all of this. And the worst is the word boundaries. You know, you know, you're, this, this is my boundary, sort of came into my personal space and all of that, yeah? Um, so we have all these phrases now that, that, you know, we need to be careful about, especially in some of these new age IT organizations. Gosh, it's a nightmare some days, you know, to deal, deal uh, with, with situations. Um, yeah, so two or three times a year, I do a, a Lenten, Lenten meditation. I know you're supposed to do it only during that, the, those 40 days, but I love doing it because, you know, it's structured, it focuses on the cross. So I'm doing this book uh, now called 40 Days of Decrees. Okay, beautiful book, short sort of write-ups, worth looking at, at least if you're planning for what to do during Lent in those 40 days. This is a good book to kind of, um, you know, keep with you, written by a lady. Um, so in one of those days, I think it was sometime this week, um, you know, she talks about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, what we call the Palm Sunday. Uh, you know, and Jesus is coming in. It's his, um, you know, he, he's walking in and people are overflowing with love and throwing their cloaks on the ground and palms and etc. All of that is happening. It must have been beautiful to see. You know, just a sidebar. Uh, you know, Jesus allowed it. He allowed that expression of spontaneous love and affection. Uh, you know, sometimes which we curb <laughs> for ourselves because we've got these boundaries. Um, but yeah, so Jesus is coming in um, and the Pharisees were aghast at, at the behavior of um, the crowds. So of course they went to Jesus and said, please control your, your people. Um, and they refused to participate. What a historic moment. You know, you're standing there, you're standing on the, uh, on, on the precipice of history. Something beautiful is happening, but they refuse to participate. They had their boundaries. I'm sorry. I mean, like, this is our position. We have to be dignified. These are certain ways we have to behave. You know, I can't, of course, let my guard down, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all that we, that we build for ourselves. Um, so they refused to participate, and they lost out on one of the greatest moments of history, you know? Um, and the Bible, if you look at it through this lens, the lens of spectatorship, you see that's the biggest loss that everyone had over and over and over again. Uh, you know, the Good Samaritan story, not my job, I have to move on, I'm late for that meeting. The spectatorship mentality, you know, I'll do this much and not more than that. 
because I have my, I need my me time, I have my boundaries, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so yeah, so the Pharisees didn't participate. So let me tell you something today that you may not want to hear. I'm, I'm sure you all came here to, for God to reiterate what we already know and you know reinforce my thinking and all of that. So I'm going to tell you something you may not want to hear. Relationships and connections are not made in your comfort zone. Yeah? Um, relationships and connections are not made in your me time. It's not made when you put up these, you and I put up these, I'm not, when I say you, I mean myself completely. Um, it's not made when we put up these big boundaries. Um, relationships don't happen, connections don't happen when I say only this much and no further. Sorry. This, this is where you come in and not beyond that. After this, it's all about me. Um, you know, relationships happen in those vulnerable moments. Relationships happen when you let people in, in some of your most difficult times in life. Um, when we turn our hesitations into obedience. You know, in those moments when we say, oh, I don't want anyone here with me now. You know, that's the time God really uses us and uh, when we submit in obedience. I want to tell you the story of Jackie Pullinger. I'm sorry, I, I didn't intend to give you so many books to read. It's a, it's a lovely consequence, I hope. Uh, have you heard of Jackie Pullinger? Yes, no? No? Okay, one, yes? Wonderful, thank you. So Jackie Pullinger has written this book, Chasing the Dragons. For those of you who like movies, it's a movie also, so you can watch that. Um, yeah, so she writes this book, Chasing the Dragons, but her story is beautiful, and I'm going to take a, a couple of minutes to just whet your appetite so that I hope you go and read the book. Uh, so Jackie Pullinger, um, in the 1960s, God called her, um, and uh, her calling was very simple, you know, that to tell people about Jesus. She was, she, for her, it was, I think she was 19, 20 around that time. And for her, it was unimaginable that why would you not, when you know there is eternal life, right? When you know that there is eternal damnation, why wouldn't you be out there telling people every day, day in and day out? I mean, like it seemed, that seemed natural to her. So that was her calling. You know, that was her problem that, uh, you know, God had placed on her heart. So um, she gets on a boat. In fact, she stopped in Bombay, and I, I was with a friend uh, this whole week, and both of us are big fans of Jackie Pullinger. So I said, what if she had stayed back in Bombay? So she takes this boat from England, um, and she doesn't know where she's going, and she says, wherever God tells me to get off, I'm going to get off there. She gets down at Bombay, um, doesn't feel that this is her place, uh, gets back on the boat and goes to Hong Kong, and she reaches the walled city of Hong Kong. Google the picture when you can. You know, the words of it sounds exciting, but look at the picture and it will horrify you, right? So it's this most, possibly the most crowded place there. And uh, she's led to, she's this 19, 20 year old, you know, has no idea of the language. And she's in that place and, um, you know, she's called to work with drug addicts and prostitutes and all of those things, you know, all those spaces which you know, we don't want to get too involved in. So yeah, so she's called to uh, work there. And, um, you know, she's, she's now, of course, she's founded the St. Stephen Society. Please go ahead and read it when you can. And she says these words. She spent her life there. She's still in Hong Kong. You can Google her lovely videos of her on YouTube speaking. And she says this about boundaries uh, that I wanted to share with you. Believe, um, people say that they need to guard their borders, but we need to enlarge our tent pegs. Okay, people say they need to guard their borders, but we need to enlarge our tent pegs. Most of us don't need the grace of God because we are only doing what we can manage. Most of us don't need the grace of God, me included. Most of us don't need the grace of God because we are doing only what we can manage. The grace of God comes in when I'm, when I'm in, in my weakness only he is my strength, no? Right? In my weakest moments, in my vulnerable moments, in those moments when, Lord, this person is so difficult to handle, Lord. In that moment is grace. In our weakness, only he can be our strength. Right? I'll repeat it because it's such a beautiful line. Believe, people say they need to guard their borders, 
but we need to enlarge our tent pegs in a world that is becoming smaller and smaller for people you know when their whole life revolves around their phone when their whole life is so protected right you know what are you and i doing to enlarge our uh, our our homes our tent pegs most of us don't need the grace of god because only doing what we can manage you know um uh, viveka knows this is last one week i was in punjab uh, i was telling you with a few of my friends it's my first time on a mission trip and wow what an amazing experience uh, you know um just to see people meeting in backyards in homes on mud ground sitting and worshiping and praying people have opened their homes with no regard for okay my expensive stuff is around what will happen H- how will i cater to so many people you know cleanliness after they leave no people are generously opening their homes uh, for for their neighbors to come and sit for for their community to worship together um, you know i want to tell you this the need in our country is huge you know um we are privileged with what we are receiving uh, i remember one message last year that i heard about, from a pastor who could hardly speak much english you know but what he said was so powerful he said this one line that i'll never forget he said um you know we are we are actually allowed to hear christ only once about christ only once everything else is luxury we hear it day after day week after week month after, sometimes two three times in a day people are pouring into our lives yeah we only once is the right given to us you know once we have to hear about christ after that we have to take and run with it but then we we hear it over and over and over again which is a luxury but what about all those who don't hear it even once you know what are we doing the need in our country is huge the need in in the corporate world our workspaces is massive you know um i haven't written this down and i and i don't i didn't intend to say this but i feel i should say this here i know work from home is amazing okay i know it's convenient but we as believers need to get out there we are placed in the marketplace for a reason yeah let's get out there let's be meeting people let's have coffee with people let's have people are hurting people need conversations people need relationships yeah so um are we standing on the sidelines with our boundaries with our sort of uh, you know all that we have put up to protect ourselves um or are we getting out there and getting involved so the third thing spectatorship to involvement so the first one was compartmentalization to connectedness the second is individualization to impact and the third is spectatorship to involve enough of standing in the sidelines let's get in there let's get our hands dirty and enough of listening to me we're going to do a small exercise if you thought you're going to get away with just sitting um so what you're going to do now you all have your notepads at your table pens yes no yes. okay um so you're going to sit down and write for 1 minute you're going to think and you're going to write who has been the biggest influence in your life one name okay listen to the instructions so you're going to write down in your book who has been the biggest influence in your life one name two names i don't want to restrict and then you're going to turn to your neighbor and share yeah so you'll have one one minute to write one minute for each of you to share so 3 minutes in total any questions yeah so write down two or three names of people that have influenced you genuinely and then turn to your neighbor and share i'll i'll tell you when time's up All right. <laughs> I know it's very personal and exciting to talk about, yeah. <laughs> All right, how many of you listen to me carefully because I want to see a, a show of hands. How many of you had uh, Prime Minister Modi? <laughs> you can't laugh. It's not <laughs> genuine question. <laughs> okay, nobody. How many of you had Siddaramaiah? At least him. <laughs> no but these are positions of power i mean they've strived lifelong to come there how many, okay how many of you had the president at least please one of you who is the <laughs> okay <laughs> that's a different conversation <laughs> how many of you had your father amazing how many of you had your mother parents basically father mother just look just put your hands up for parents how many of you had parents just look around the room 
Rajiv, you are the mathematician. What's the percentage? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Historically speaking, 70% usually lifts their hands up. Yeah, so it's, how many of you had pasta? Very nice. How many of you had grandparents, uncle, aunt? Lovely. How many of you had Sunday school teacher? <laughs> Beautiful. Teachers, Sunday school teachers, yeah. Um, you know, we underestimate the influence we can have on people, right? We think you need to have a position, you need to have a title, you need to have this, that. Some of the people who are most, in, you know, you know, org chart or organizations say this, we have an official organization chart and we have an unofficial, actually who makes the decisions, right? Like, you know, it's not the boss, it's someone the boss trusts that's actually driving a lot of stuff. You know, it's not about position. It's not about, if you're sitting here thinking, I'm too junior to impact people's life. You know, I'm, I'm not doing a corporate job to be able to impact people's life. Or, you know, I'm, I'm no, I don't speak English that well to be able to influence. It doesn't really matter. Yeah? It's relationship that matters. It's only relationship that matters. You know, at, at the point of building a relationship is where impact happens. Um, you know, so whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, you're influencing someone today. Yeah? You may not have thought about it before, but each one of you sitting here is an influence to someone in your life. Someone is looking at you and learning. Positively or negatively, I cannot tell. But they are learning something from you. They are being influenced by you. <laughs> yeah? So... Uh, all of us are influencers. All of us are impacting people. All of us are, you know, um, influencing others. So you might sit and ask me uh, today, you know, so how do I actually positively influence people? How do I build that connection? How do I influence? Um, you know, I, I'll reiterate this, if this is the one thing you take away, that relationship is the only way to have a long-term influence. Position, title, power is control. It's not influence. You can control their actions. But the moment they're out of the house, that's it. I remember my parents were very, very strict with my brother. He's 14 years elder to me. And uh, they were, I think they learned all their lessons with him. And I was very well brought up. Rajiv, please don't tell my brother. <laughs> um, you know, but the moment he left home, he was, <laughs> he was a different guy, you know. So all that control and all of that didn't work with him. You know, only relationship, influence works. Uh, so how do you build relationships? I just want to, I'm sure many of you are amazing at what you do, but I just want to share my experience on three or four points. One is intentionality. I should want to build a relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, I should want to invest in you. I should want to spend time with you. So intentionality is the first step. Number two is prayer. Uh, you know, who are you thinking of influencing? Who is in being influenced? We write down their names, pray for them, start thinking about them, you know, um, and God will give you the right next steps with respect to that person. Number three, making time for them. Yeah? Uh, again, you know, our boundaries, all of that. If you're genuinely interested in investing in someone, if I genuinely want to invest in you, I need to make time for you. Yeah? Um, Fourthly, walking with them through times of pain. Yeah? If I'm going through a difficult time, if you're going through a difficult time, am I with you through that? When you're in the hospital struggling with that loneliness, am I there visiting you? Um, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with a job, am I helping you write your resume? Am I helping you get circulated, help you through that time? You know, how am I walking with you through your times of pain? Fifthly, not giving up, okay? Uh, you know, I'm not giving up on you halfway through this. Um, and not giving up means less of me and more of you. When I'm not giving up on you, it means you, your needs, your uh, sort of what you need is far more important than, you know, where I am at that point in time. Lastly, the responsibility is on me to meet them at their circumstance in a way that relates to them. Okay, and I'll substantiate what I'm saying after I repeat it. The responsibility is on me to meet them 
in their circumstance in a way that relates to them. Uh, and I'll give you Jesus' example. What was Jesus' profession? Carpenter. Half the examples he gave are what? Fishing examples. As far as I know, I don't think he was a fisherman. Yeah, he didn't give any carpentry examples because he knew the guys following a fisherman. Let me give them examples that they will understand. Yeah, he called them fishers of men. He said, put your net on this side and you'll get... He helped them and met them at the point of their need. Yeah, so the responsibility is on me. If I want to build a relationship with you, Suresh, responsibility is on me to meet you at the point of your need, not expect you to rise to or to meet me where I am, right? So these are the various thoughts on building relationships. So again, go back to your notes, quickly write down who do you want to connect with or whom do you want to influence? Who do you want to build a relationship? Can you put down three names there? I'm not going to ask you to share that with anyone, but put it down. Writing helps clarify our thoughts. Be noteworthy. Quickly, have you finished praying? If you have, slip your hand up so I'll know. Okay, wonderful. Um, you might be sitting there and thinking, all this gyan is fine. Okay, all this is nice. Very, thank you for telling me. But relationships are hard, right? Yes, how many of you have been hurt in relationships? <laughs> All of us, right? If we don't put up a hand, we're lying. Um, people will hurt us. People will betray us. Connecting with them is hard. Relationships are hard. Uh, relationships, I'm going to tell you today, will cost you. Because it cost my God. And it cost him his death on the cross, right? It cost Jesus his life on the cross because he loved you and me, because he wanted a relationship with you and me. If he is willing to pay the price, so should you and me. Um, you know, relationships it's, is costly. It will cost us our ego. Of course, money, time, etc. is a given. It will cost us our ego. We'll have to forgive. We'll have to lose our dignity at times. We'll have to be the one who calls. We'll have to be the one who lands up, who shows up. It will cost us our ego. Um, so I want to tell you that don't give up. You know, we are called, our purpose is people. We are called to impact people positively. You've written down three names. You're going to go back and look at ways of connecting with them. Um, so I'm going to pray this blessing from Ephesians chapter 3 over you as you bow down your heads in prayer. Uh, I'm going to pray this blessing over you that God will strengthen us as we go back into the world and connect with people. So let's close our eyes. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 onwards I'm reading. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen.